Navasemen was one of the first to write about the influence of the silent memories of the Holocaust survivors on the members of the second and third generation. She wrote several books about it. In her book, And the Rat Laughs, published in 2001, Semel indicates the inability of the integrative narrative memory to bury the remembrance and replace the silence. An old woman, as she is called throughout the book, tries to tell her granddaughter of her traumatic experiences during the Holocaust. She tries to tell her story to pass on her memory, but she can't lay her memory bare in the form of a coherent narrative, only conveying hazy fragments, a shell of the story, as she calls it. A girl, father, mother, feet, darkness, a rat, and a figure called Stefan. She finds it impossible to condense the original traumatic experience that transcends the bonds of imagination and understanding into a template of words, into the recognized language and accepted representation. The narrative story fails, and it seems as if the memory has been buried forever. But Semel doesn't stop here. She's offering an alternative to the narrative memory. When the fragmented traumatic story transforms into a fictional work of art, a tale, a poem, a myth, as they appear in the various chapters of Semel's book, something happens to the recipient, even into the future, almost 200 years after the horrific events took place. They feel something of the original trauma. They connect to the heart of the trauma, the darkness, which the old lady tried in vain to explain in words. They remember something. Their encounter with the darkness is accompanied by an uncanny feeling. It's foreign, frightening, and discomforting, but at the same time, familiar, almost homely. It isn't mine, says one character, and suddenly it is. Some of the four women at four different points in time and a darkness that connects them to one traumatic story. These are four points on, as Semel terms it, the relay race of remembrance. All without the lucid factual narrative story being told even once to one of those who remember it. So how do they remember? She got in use to not being able to remember the words Semel writes of the old woman. Darkness was what she could feel. End of quote. Quote. Against the silence, narrative memory, Semel posits the emotional memory, a memory located beyond the events and facts themselves. The emotional memory preserves an emotional extract of the original trauma, passing, passing under the threshold of the consciousness of the sender and recipient in whom it beats as a living heartbeat. Semel signals the aesthetic fictional realm as one that enables the transfer of the emotional memory. When a silent memory is processed into a fictional story, poem, myth, or other fictional work, it succeeds in making its presence felt as an emotional memory. How does it happen? In Semmel's book, the emotion attached to the traumatic experience is not purely a conscious entity. Emotion possesses a physical essence that is engraved into the body, is branded into the flesh, it sticks between the teeth, between the, the legs, it blazes visually on the flesh like a tattoo. It pervades the blood, every cell and neuron. For those bearing a memory, it is all, always accompanied by strong physical sensations, such as nausea and vomiting. The psychoanalyst and literary scholar, Julia Kristeva, identifies the bodily sensory dimension as belonging to a pre-verbal semiotic realm in which the child experience, experiences the bond with its mother via raw sensory impressions, bodily composure, sensual feelings, rhythm, and tone. The semiotic physical sensory realm is not identified by formal, organized, and symbolic language, is not subject to its rules, and cannot be expressed by it. The vivid physical emotional impressions at the heart of the traumatic experience belong to this pre-verbal semiotic realm that precludes them from being coherently formulated via the organized grammatical and linguistic structures of symbolic language. Pre-verbal semiotic communication does not disappear when a child begins to communicate via symbolic language, but rather takes a backseat, retreats to the unconscious. In order to reveal the semiotic behind the symbolic and to give voice to the physical emotional impression, we must use language in a way that will dismantle the organized, arranged, and disciplinary structures of the symbolic language. 
poetic language used in the act of art of Semel Turnbull achieves this in several different ways, which I will briefly illustrate via the lyric fragment in the third chapter of Semel's book. The corpus of poem in this chapter contains violent and harsh texts whose origin is unknown. They are home to the characters from the old woman's fragmented story, a girl, father, mother, a rat, and Stefan. The poetic language uses an entire poetic lexicon to resist the symbolic language, the very words and sentences in which it is itself composed, thereby exposing the semiotic realm. For example, ideas from one semantic field are used to describe experiences and feelings from an entirely different one, driving a wedge between markers and the indicated term. Like in the poem called Warm, I'll never be cold, for dirt is my blanket. I'll always be warm, for I'll cover with blood. The expectation created by the use of markers that are familiar to us from the semantic fields of warmth and safety is shattered in the face of the unusual pairing with dirt and blood taken from the semantic field of death and war. There is also a transgressive gap between the poem linguistic register, childish, naive, and innocent tone, and their shocking and sinister content that does not allow us to accept them at, at face value. For example, in the poem, green is what comes out of your mouth, red is what comes out of your leg, brown is what comes out from behind, black is light. Another way in which poetic language enables the semiotic to penetrate the symbolic is by exposing the language materialistic and formative aspects and the game in which it engages with them. Example of this includes the use of oxymorons, contracts, metaphors, and metonymies, such as black is light, my body makes rain, and a whole child is running out of steam. The text also features numerous repetitions that emphasizes the symbolic language artificiality, such as in the poem of Riddle. Where's the little girl? What little girl? Was there ever a little girl? The compressed repetitiveness also seems to stain rhythm and musicality, which are some of the signs of the semiotic realm. Samuel also uses different allusions to children's songs, stories, and games. She embeds in the poem in a way that splits the original meaning, presenting them in a threatening and disturbing light. The poem Lullaby, for example, opens with words from a magical legend. Once upon a time, there was a little Jewish girl and she had little Jewish hands, but it's quickly twisted into a nightmarish poem and a little Jewish body and a big hole. The poem Catch seemingly describes the familiar game, but its content reveal a horrific reality. If I run away, he, he gets even more wild. That's the game that we play, the Stefan the child. The refusal to be written within the framework of the accepted marking convention instilled the poetic language with an element of subversion and position it as a liminal language, which undermines and cracks the boundaries of symbolic language, thereby exposing the semiotic realm in which the emotional memory is seared, given the trauma, a voice. Thank you.